Hey guys, welcome back to the Mind Muscle Connection. I'm Joe Klimczewski with Tyler Wee. We're going to talk about thinking. And uh, the, the first quote that came to my mind, Tyler, was, I think, therefore I am. I, I think that's the way it was by Descartes. Um, but this whole concept, this is, I, I know we're going to regret it by the end of our 20 or so minutes because we always dive into these topics that are just like, you know, in, entire master's degree level courses. But at the same time, speaking to our audience, hard training, fitness community, health oriented people, it, it seems like every single podcast and bit of content is always geared toward that. Let's talk about training. Let's talk about nutrition. And you and I started this because we want to talk about the deep topics that relate to all of our lives because it's through that framework that will make these fitness and health and training endeavors fruitful or not. So you know, when, I, when I thought of this topic, just thinking about thinking or thinking about thoughts, I thought, you know, what, what are all the things that go into that? And I came up with a couple. I knew you would as well. But kind of the way it flowed through my mind is, is that, that, you know, Descartes quote, which is a little bit ontological, you know, our, our human experience defines us. And then I think the first big division, and, and I'm certainly somebody who's going to talk more about the, the neurological side, the, the cognitive psychology side, the, the, the whole study of thinking can be thought of as cognitive psychology. But somewhere along the line, our species became very dualistic. And we started thinking, well, I think with this thing that's outside of me, it's my mind, it's my soul. And so here is my body and my body just carries around my thoughts and my consciousness. And, and of course, you know, I don't believe that. I believe conscious emanates from our, our brain and our, our organic being. So, so you almost have to know which side of that framework you're speaking from, because if we're going to if we're going to relate this to training, you know, let's dive right into this. Uh, how my worldview is, how I think about thinking will dictate whether or not I believe this training system is perfect because it's coming from my my hero over here. Or I believe that this nutrition is, is the right way to go, not this, because I read this particular study or headline. And so how we think gets into things like our biases, it gets into how we even process information. And so just through my introduction here, I, I hope, I know you do, Tyler, but I hope our audience sees how vast this really is. And we can't talk about every single tangent, but when you just, just hear that thought, when, when you got my email and I said, hey, Tyler, let's do a podcast about thinking, you know, what, what kind of went through your mind? How do we think? <laughs> and, and just the, the, the deep aspect of thinking and, you know, how much are we controlled? I don't want to say controlled, but how much are we influenced, you know, by our not just massive experiences within our life that, you know, we can pull up at the, you know, at a, in a heartbeat of go, yeah, that influenced me in this way, but also the, you know, subtle day-to-day -day experiences and how do they begin to, you know, influence our thinking and, you know, what do we tell ourselves as we are going through those experiences? You know, what kind of biases, you know, have we created? What kind of narratives do we tell ourselves through those experiences that we've been through in life? You know, for example, for me, and, and I'm sure, you know, this, is, this can happen to a lot of people, self-talk. Self-talk can be a very, very difficult thing. And I think it's something that a lot of us will talk about, you know, how we struggle with our own internal self-talk. Now, there's definitely, I think, some people out there that maybe don't struggle with it. But I know for myself that there are certain triggers that through my experience in life, that if that kind of X happens, I know that that can start a spiral down into negative self-talk. And so it's being aware of how we think through our experiences, I think, where that starts to become, you know, very interesting, the process of, of growing and, you know, realizing, you know, what things are going to, you know, crop up experience wise that might start triggering, triggering a certain thought process. You know, where you just went, I, I think I had not even thought of this before we sat down for this chat, but as you talk about experience and, and how we think and what's even in our brains to think about, 
you know, think, think back to all the definitions of consciousness. This is a really big topic right now. Uh, a, a few years ago, somebody dedicated like this is the decade of the brain and people, you know, things like neural link and, and the capacity to potentially do biomechanical changes to the brain and, and putting interfaces in the brain. Uh, it's it's going to get crazy. But at the same time, the greatest framework, in my opinion, for even thinking about how we think consciousness is, is the concept called the global neural network. And for the people behind the global neural network philosophy, it's this simple definition, consciousness, how we even think. Because if I died right now, I don't think anymore. Like it's over. My brain is gone. There are no more thoughts that come from my brain. So the definition of consciousness is every single bit of knowledge, memory, and experience stored in my brain knowledge, memory, and experience in my capacity to, to recall it, to actually utilize it. Because I don't, you know, I'm, if I'm asleep, I'm not accessing that actively. If I'm unconscious, if I'm in a coma. So, so with that kind of a framework, now we say, okay, that's, that's how we think. We, we have these memories, these experiences. So if I want to improve the way I think, I need to do one of two things. I need to put better information in there to think about, which is through knowledge or self-talk. And I need to learn to access it better, which can get into process-oriented things like meditation and just thoughtfulness, mindfulness. You know, one of the one of the books I pulled off my shelf for this discussion is, you know, 2008. This has become a classic already. Carol Dweck's book on mindset. Everybody refers to it because she made this simple heuristic. If you want to be a better thinker, you only have two paths. You either have a closed mind or you have an open mind. A closed mind presupposes that everything I already know is right. Everything else is wrong. There's no room for change. There's no room for new information because I've got all the fucking answers right here. And that's a closed mind. An open mind says, well, I don't know. I don't even know what I don't know. So I need to be open to new information. I need to sift through it. I need to trust myself to think about it. And I think that's the cornerstone of thinking better. If you don't have an open mindset, which is Dr. Dweck's entire premise, you're done. I mean, it's you might you may as well just call your life over. Yeah, and that's funny because they, they, you kind of went to the open and, and closed mindset because those were some of the notes that I had written down prior to, to us talking as well, but maybe more so in the direction of, you know, why is that so hard to go from a closed mindset to an open mindset? You know, what, what kind of stops us from, from having that? And I think it can come really down to, you know, we are such tribal animals at the, at the end of the day. We're you know, we're monkeys who can think like, you know what I mean? Like that's, that is really is what it is, but we still have that, that tribal nature in us and, you know, where we grow up, who we grow up with has, you know, such big influences, you know, on how we think our culture that we grow up around can just shape that from an early age, you know, for myself, you know, growing up, you know, religious, you know, that's boom, that's, that's your worldview, right? Like you don't really have much of a choice. I mean, you have a choice, but it's presented as not having much of a choice and thinking in different ways is scary. It's not just a logical thought process. It's, it's an emotional thought process too, because we take these identities and we, mold them into ourselves and they have their emotional hooks in us too, because you go from, well, this is how I've always looked at things, you know, with the color of water glasses or what I blanking on that saying, but you see the, you know, the world in a certain color and to see that world in a completely different color is unfathomable because all you're told is, well, this is the only way, this is the truth. You know, this is just, you know, how you're supposed to see things. That's how my parents did. And so opening yourself up to different ways and maybe admitting you were wrong, that's not an easy thing to do for anyone. No one likes to admit that they're wrong. No one wants to feel stupid, right? Or how they've been thinking for you know this long may not be the, the correct way of thinking, if you will. And it, and it can be hard because you are, you know, on a bunch of different levels, you know, separating yourself from, you know, who you were previously. And that's never an easy transition. That's never an easy change because 
you know, it comes with trying to, you know, rip out emotional hooks. It comes with potentially losing family, losing friends because of you might think a different way. And so it's, you know, typically that, you know, going against whatever herd you're in, that's kind of what keeps us in there. Even if we logically don't think that way, we still kind of continue to follow because it's just the, the thought of jumping over the line just really never, you know, becomes powerful enough to maybe really stimulate that change. I, I'm not exaggerating, Tyler, when I say you literally just checked every box on the rest of my notes. Um, <laughs> All right, that's it. We're done again. Ten it, minutes. <laughs> no, seriously, it is. Uh, you're exactly right. It is for safety and security for somebody who's who has that closed mindset. It, it, it is because of that identity protection. And for the person who says there's only one way to train and there's only one way to eat and there's only one way to approach my competitive career, again, they, they found that identity. They're believing somebody and they, they've, they've joined that clan. And now for safety and security, they can't let it go. Not unless, as you said, it's not very easy that those hooks are in. And another book, and this is, this is my last show and tell uh, that I pulled <laughs> off my book or off my shelf is The Believing Brain by Michael Shermer. He's also a neuroscientist who, um, I read this book 10 years ago. And when I opened it back up, I probably haven't opened it in 10 years. I, it looks like I exploded a highlighter through it. Like that's how many <laughs> notes I took in this book. And, and the one thing that, that really struck me is he, he wrote this list of, I think it's like 22 or 25 biases. Like we've heard of a confirmation bias, but there are things like the authority bias, the bandwagon effect, the Barnum effect, the believable, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go through all those, but the one thing that he explained that I loved, and, and this is what I pulled out is he has an entire chapter on the believing neuron. And he talks about how the hormone dopamine, which we all seem to kind of come back to, it's the, it's the real, you know, cool poster child of this era is the fact that, you know, dopamine is, is the, is the neurotransmitter that promotes the pursuit of something. It's not the fact, you know, like, like think of the uh, just vastly sometimes painful, stressful, and uh, almost depressing anticlimactic effect when you're done with a powerlifting meet or a bodybuilding contest. Everything you've been building toward for six months, every second of every day has been devoted to this. And then win, lose, or draw, when it's over, you have no idea what to do the next day. You don't know what to think. You don't know what to feel. And it's because dopamine's real drive is for pursuit. And you no longer have anything to pursuit because that it was over yesterday now. And, and so if, if that's what your thinking is based around and you don't have the, the emotional and intellectual framework to think along multiple planes, like here's my goal, this is my nutrition life, this is my training life and so forth. But it's, you know, I have all these other layers of depth and complexity and I can be very open-minded to change. I can, I can say, well, this is the way I'm training now, but I'd love to go learn and see what this person has to offer. That kind of emotional and intellectual fluidity is what keeps us moored to a balanced, even keel life. You can still be a super achiever. You can do everything. Matter of fact, I would argue you would do it better because you have the stability to just do your thing, but still roll with the punches. And this, and this might go in a, in a slightly different direction, it, but it's more so talking about, you know, the knowledge and, and the experience. And we have so much personal control over those two things and how we consume those things. And if we know that, you know, I, mean, I guess we have control over our memory as well, but there is so much out there that, you know, you and I just don't know, like I love going on just tangents on other experts and just seeing what they know and understand and how they look at the world differently because there is just so much out there and such a depth of knowledge out there of experts that, you know, to close yourself off to, to that knowledge, I feel like is doing yourself like such a big disservice because it's pretty cool how much people know and how much like, we understand of our physical world and, you know, it, yeah, it, to me, it is really, really awesome. And I think, you know, in any aspect, you know, especially, you know, with us talking about bodybuilding, 
and there being so many hills to die on, you know, you got to go keto, you know, clean dieting, you got to water fast, you got to, you know, you could probably fill pages and pages with things that, you know, people like you have to do. But if we could just kind of like go, oh, there's so much that we know about the human body and how to make it look better. Like, let's go check that all out. Like, there's probably not a one right answer. There's probably multiple ways that I could get to it based off of who I am. And I need to go find that one thing that might work the best for me because there is so much out there. And so I think just even from that aspect alone of just how cool it is to know how much I don't know and then how much other people know and just to be able to experience that knowledge, you know, had just so much value to your life. You know, you, you said it so perfectly earlier in just that that is a bridge people can't cross, not not easily. And I listened to a, a real short podcast by Neil deGrasse Tyson yesterday. And then this morning I saw a tweet by just a political shit bag. And, and they're, they're, they're so opposite that I think it's worth contrasting here. Uh, because talk about the same topic. Neil deGrasse Tyson, another well, he, an astrophysicist, was saying, you know, people it's in vogue right now to just shit on science, like especially because of the pandemic and so forth. And he said, science in itself is nothing but an open-ended question. It's constantly like, like as soon as you put forth a hypothesis and you've run it through the scientific method of some form of research, you immediately give it to the world to be peer reviewed, knowing that everybody else is going to pick it apart some people may agree, some people won't, and, and people will reproduce it. If, you, if nobody can reproduce it, then you know it was wrong, and that's okay. You go try something else. It's never about being right. It's never about having it, or it shouldn't be. I mean, trust me, there are some scientists who do, who, who bring in their own ideology, and that's just, that's not real science. But when you look at it, as you mentioned, as something that I must defend this, this is right, and I will argue you are instantly, you should be instantly triggered that that person is somebody to stay away from. And if you find yourself feeling those feelings, you got to check yourself and say, wait a second, why do I think that's right? You know, may, is there, is there truly nothing else I could learn? Is there nothing else to be questioned? I mean, in a hundred years, 500 years, are they going to look back and say, wow, that person had it all right. Like they knew everything and we never learned anything else. So you really have to separate ideology versus just curiosity and open-mindedness. Yeah. I, I think that's because you still need, you know, your principles that ground you. I still think you need to be able to build yourself around certain principles, but they, they, they almost have to be flat. You have to be flexible with them because something new might pop up that is going to challenge them. And you've got to be open to that challenge and reevaluate, go, oh, presented with new information. Maybe I thought about that in the wrong way. So maybe the core principle changes, but how you think about it, you know, changes in a different aspect. And maybe, you know, you're able to then take that next step. And then, you know, therefore now you're open to maybe more information down the road. And so you can almost just even snowball like that. And you're able to you're able to evolve, you're able to change, you're able to adapt. And I mean, adaption is survival. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'll wrap it up with what the other side of that equation was that political hack, you know, his quote was, you know, speaking again of pandemic stuff, he said, isn't it interesting how, and he put in quotes, science changes, ha ha ha. And I'd be like, yeah, dipshit. Of course it changes because we constantly get new information and new understanding and, and, you know, we don't just evolve, the world evolves. And so, yeah, if you don't expect it to change, you don't understand science. And, and to all of our listeners and viewers, that's, that's my biggest point here. It's just to be that open-minded and just to constantly have a level of humility to say, man, I want to learn everything. Of course, I have to act on stuff every day. Like I have to execute something, but at the same time, I'm going to keep one eye out there for what's happening next and how can I evolve and how can I adapt? So, uh, Tyler, again, just a, a, a super topic and contribution. It's amazing how we don't really prepare this and then we end up with so many of the same notes and yeah. so forth. So, uh, yeah, so great work. I uh, uh, appreciate it. And, and at the time of recording this, it, we're almost turning over a new year. So hope everybody 
if you're watching this in almost real time, have a great new year. Tyler, I'll see you next time. And we will see you guys next time on the Mind Muscle Connection.